Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a wonderful show for you this evening. Two of my favorite people in aviation are here with us tonight, Barry and Brian Schiff, and you are guaranteed to leave the program a better pilot than when you arrived or your money back. Uh, it is going to be so much fun to learn from both of them, and uh, I, I just cherish every opportunity to spend. Uh, before we get started, uh, as always, there's a lot going on in Social Flight, so be sure to check out socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps for Apple and Android devices. We are just wrapping up now, March 1st, our Lightspeed Zulu 3 giveaway as part of the Fly to Win Challenge. And uh, when that program ends, we immediately kick off a new one with a brand new prize. All you need to do is get the Social Flight mobile app get out there and fly. And you land at even a single airport during the prize period, check in, you get points for landing there, and uh, it's just a, a great way to inspire you to fly. Of course, Social Flight has all the different places to fly, events, $100 hamburgers, destinations, you name it. We are here to support general aviation and to give you missions and reasons to get to the airport and off the couch and go flying. So be sure to check that out as well. And of course, you can check out our YouTube channel where we have so many other things going on, including our Titan T-51D Mustang build. We just released some new videos on that. That's this uh, little cool tail that you see behind me here in the studio that also doubles as our house and also our build facility. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to get started tonight. Brian and Barry Schiff are, are two people that I am just thrilled to call friends. Um, with 28,000 hours logged in more than 30, 355 different types of aircraft, a best-selling author and more awards than we have time to list, Barry Schiff is an aviation legend. And his son, Brian, isn't far behind. As a captain for a major U.S. airline, an innovative educator in his own right, and someone I have learned so many different flying tips from, he is my go-to source whenever I come across uh, uh, issues or challenges or just have a question. Uh, it's, uh, they're really just wonderful. And I am thrilled to call them both friends. And so let me bring them on the line right now, both Barry and Brian Schiff here to join us tonight and talk about aviation and how to improve your flying. Welcome, gentlemen. Hi, how are you doing? So um, I, I want to start, uh, first of all, of course, uh, by thanking both of you. Uh, had an had a incredible lifetime opportunity uh, to, uh, to go a few weeks ago to the uh, Aviation Living Legends of Aviation event. Uh, Barry, that was because of you and Brian uh, making all of that possible uh, as well and, and being able to attend that with you. Uh, you're a living legend, Barry, and, uh, and Brian, you're on the way to becoming one. So uh, I just want to thank you for making that possible. That was an amazing night. My pleasure. I'm glad you, glad you had a good time. And my thanks life for, failed. And, and thanks for being my date. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good date. <laughs> worked out well. Um, so one of the ways that I want to get started, uh, I thought this would be a great opportunity to, to uh, try to bring both of your talents together in one place on, on some education. And Barry, I want to start because um, there's a, a topic you wrote an article recently on for uh, AOPA Pilot and uh, also that uh, I know, Brian, you've been doing a lot of work on, and it's been mind-blowing for me. It is this concept that the this speed, which seems to be the most critical speed anyone's ever taught in their primary training from their instructor, VX. Oh, you need to know VX for your airplane. And you uh, both are shedding light that this, instead of being the speed to always think about that should be saving you, this is the speed that actually we should be scared of a little bit. And, and, and can you fill me in on this? Yeah. Um... It, it happens, uh, there was an accident not too long ago, and uh, Brian and I saw the video of this thing. A fella took off uh, in a Howard, uh, and there's a video of it on YouTube. Uh, and he was making a climb at VX, practicing a, uh, you know, a short field takeoff and climbing over an obstacle, something that all students are taught and every flight instructor teaches. But if you have an engine failure while doing that at about 100 feet, roughly, you're gonna you're gonna have a serious accident and maybe even get seriously hurt. 
because there's nothing you can do to prevent stalling or mushing seriously into the ground. And Brian, I think you you did some uh, tests on the computer with that too. It, there's no way to there's no way to make a decent landing out of an engine failure from 100 feet. Yeah, and I know Jeff, you did it as well in your flight simulator. I watched your son try it as well, and in, in the airplane, you know, for years I've been teaching that long, 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 long time, and pilots are tested on it, and we have to teach them to do it on their check rides. But I never felt comfortable doing it. I'm thinking, gosh, if something happens right here. Uh, there's really nothing you can do. There's not enough airspeed or altitude to recover from that and flare. Yeah. Now, the so problem it, is if, if you're, let's say, at 100 feet and you're like this, climbing, you know, pulling, you're hanging on the prop and the engine quits. Well, if you shove the nose down the way you should to get your airspeed, you're going to crash in the ground nose first. There's no way to avoid it. And if you yeah. hold the nose where it is, you're going to just stall into the ground. So if you just level the airplane, you're going to mush into the ground, and you're going and to do really serious damage to the airplane. There's just no way to avoid it if you have an engine failure at that very critical juncture. Yeah, and then I, that's all you can do is let it mush into the ground and let the landing gear collapse and absorb that energy. Uh, those pilots in that accident actually survived, uh, and then the aircraft was consumed by post-crash fire. But it's been an interesting the conversation and comments after the YouTube video have been very interesting and enlightening to show just how much and how little is known about this. Yeah, and, I, I, and I think it's we, a topic. We, uh, it. we practice think, it, we're taught it, and, and I don't think we should. I don't think it should be given the emphasis that we give it. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, when, I, when I looked back, after I read your article and, and talked to Brian also about this, I thought back on my training, I talked to both the boys, Jake and Ben, about it, and, and they just, you know, they were within a few years of, of finishing their training. And it's interesting because the emphasis seems to be on how can we get the air, from the minute we put the power in and release the brakes, how can we get the aircraft to altitude as quickly as possible? Like, that's it. And then the only thing that they're taught and that I was taught other than that is this idea of, well, whatever altitude you've gotten to, that's going to be your decision for other things, like other topics we don't have to talk about immediately, like turn back and things like that. But that's it. There's nothing about, oh, by the way, this thing I've been drilling into your head about get get up as quick as you can, it could kill you. It, in my opinion. Yeah, in my opinion, that should be, like, VX should not be an airspeed for normal operation. It should be moved to Section 3 of the handbook, the emergency speeds. Like, if you get yourself into a situation in cruise flight and for some reason you need to get as much altitude per given uh, distance over the ground to clear a ridge or a cloud deck or whatever, then that speed should be employed, but that's at a safe altitude. Down low to the ground, if you have to plan a takeoff that requires you to do that, in my opinion, your planning has already been flawed. You should not be doing that takeoff. I agree. And it's, it's interesting, we don't have very many accidents that actually occur as the result of climbing at VX because it's such a small area where you're exposed. If uh, you have the engine failure below it or above it, you're okay. But it's that area, I don't know where it would be. It depends on the airplane. It could be from 50 feet up to 150 feet. I'm not sure. Depends on the airplane, depends on the technique a pilot uses. But uh, it, 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 you're through it so quickly that it, you're not likely to have an accident as the result of an engine failure, unless it happens within that narrow window. And if it does, you're in serious trouble. I think it, it seems from, from some of the like kind of experimenting that, that I've done based on what you've talked about, that that, that danger zone, um, exists anytime you're doing VX, doesn't it? Like it's, it, you're, you're, you're seriously in danger, of course, if it's like 100 feet uh, or something like that. But if you, even at, at a higher altitude, you, it's amazing how fast the speed goes from VX to beyond stall, blow stall. No, it does. Uh, it, it's a serious problem. I, I'd like to tell you about a very famous accident that occurred as the result of climbing out at VX. This is one of the most Famous accidents in the history of aviation. Uh, Wiley Post and uh, uh, Will Rogers were taking off in Alaska. And it was Wiley Post's uh, habit. He liked to climb steeply, as steeply as possible. 
and they were taking off from Point Barra in a seaplane, and they got up this nose high at about 100 feet, according to witnesses, and well, we know what happened. Both were killed because of just this kind of an accident. Wiley Post and Will Rogers bit the dust. Mm. And on another note, you see you're talking about that critical altitude and maybe the higher you get, the better your odds are of having enough altitude to trade for airspeed and flare. But if you're actually performing a takeoff that requires VX to clear obstacles, well, guess what's in front of you? You, you know, Even if you get to a couple hundred feet, you were trying to clear an obstacle. But that's still there. <laughs> Bad planning. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, one interesting thing, so, well, actually, you know, I think of a couple things. One is as soon as you told me about this and then you showed me that video, um, I actually took a video uh, that I had found uh, uh, recently of an accident that, that happened and uh, it, it showed the same kind of a problem. Someone had taken off an experimental aircraft and it was cockpit footage and it showed them climbing, climbing out and you could tell they thought they were doing the right thing by doing a climb out and then the initial climb out was at that VX, you know, the, as soon as that engine stopped, then you could tell that the pilot did the right thing, lowered the nose, went for it, but there was no, there was no time. And I think that's what prompted us to take our, uh, we have a, a pretty extensive flight simulator here and uh, we ran those tests using a Beach Bonanza uh, simulator and found it was remarkable that if you were doing something that was VY or better, uh, immediately after rotate, you will right through VX, at least to VY, then pull, immediately pull the engine. You were able to get back down on, on gear. You didn't, have a, you didn't have a stall, but we had a very, very hard time avoiding any type of, a, of either a stall or just no lift at all if we were at VX. I think we should reevaluate. It can be a serious problem. Is that yeah. a testing, by the way? When it, is that something that during uh, uh, and does an examiner is that required to to demonstrate VX? Yeah, they need to test private pilots short field takeoff with an obstacle. So you need to climb at VX to 50 feet and then you know clear the obstacle, and then you can accelerate to VY. But yeah, that that is part of the private pilot and commercial pilot practical tests. Yep, and it's usually usually conducted up to a little more than 50 feet, which makes it even worse. Uh, mm. I'm hoping that as a result of uh, our discussion of this topic, that perhaps the FAA and the instructor community will look a little more uh, carefully at this maneuver. So as a wrap up on, on the VX topic, because obviously we have a lot of other things also to cover, what's your recommendation to everyone here uh, on how they conduct their takeoffs and how they view VX in the future? What should change? Well, I'll tell you what I like to do if I have an obstacle ahead of me. I'll take off as quickly as I can, and I lower the nose. And I almost point the nose of the airplane at the obstacle. The airplane's going to accelerate as that happens. And as I get to the obstacle, I'll be right at the top of it, and I'll just pull the nose up a little bit and soar over it. I don't have to clear it by much to be happy. If I clear it at all, I'm very happy. And I, <laughs> I like to have some airspeed. If I have to do that, I don't take off. <laughs> I try to avoid getting Mic those. drop and kudos to Brian. <laughs> it's a good point, though. I mean, you know, folks like Bob Hoover and so many others have shown us that it's all about energy management. And, and what you're describing there sounds to me like really good energy management. You're approaching your, your obstacle with excess energy that you can then exchange when you need to. I love it. Excellent. Um, all right. So another thing I wanted to talk to you about, uh, both of you, is uh, we've looked at a lot of different accidents. You have both spent your careers looking at, at, into accidents. And it seems, of course, that uh, the pilot uh, is, is often the, the link in the chain that, that uh, is the last straw, even if there's a mechanical issue. And um, one of the things I found fascinating is, uh, Brian, how you were connecting this so much to the uh, a discipline of kind of the speed at which you do things right and that is a f true and i in fact at the airline i brief my first officers when i teach private pilots i actually teach them the same thing that you can choose one of two speeds at which to operate and i'm talking about just how fast you're moving and doing things not how fast you fly the airplane uh, and those two speeds are and i've teach this in many of the, my seminars and webinars so people may have even heard this but they're slow 
and methodical or fast and screw up. Which speed do you want to operate at? And what I've found is that when people rush, they tend to make mistakes that wind up making it actually take longer because they have to correct their mistakes. Think mm -hmm. of you, you're speeding home for dinner uh, because dinner's at six o'clock and you're running late. So you're speeding and exceeding the real limit and speed limit and rushing and you run a red light or you're speeding over the speed limit and there's a cop behind you, you get pulled over. Well, guess what? Speeding made you take longer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now you gotta, you gotta talk to the officer, get your ticket and then get home. Uh, at that point, maybe you shouldn't even go home. But so we have two speeds. And so I, in the simulator, when I'm teaching students or even in the airplane, I see that when, and typically this is in a go around scenario, I see a lot of student pilots rush to do the go around procedures and get the flaps up and power and they're, and they're hurrying through the whole procedure. And I said, well, you gotta take your time. Watch how slow I do this, 1001, pull power, push the nose flap positive rate, flaps up in one notch, and you can take it at a very slow pace, and if you time that, and then you say, okay, now do it as quickly as you can, and you go through the rushing motions and you time that, it's like mere seconds difference. Yet yeah. slow and methodical tends to not have mistakes. Uh, and so when I, when I teach in the simulator, I have them slow down, take a step by step, and slow and methodical, and don't rush. Uh, one of the common denominators in, in many of the accidents that, that we've studied is a rush to comply with air traffic control uh, or whatever it is. Can you accept immediate takeoff, clear for takeoff without delay? You know, if I hear without delay or immediate this, no, 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 I'm fine. Just, I'll just wait. And, and, and I don't want to miss something. So there's slow and screw up. Choose which one you operate at. <laughs> You know, there's something that your little story reminded me of. You talked about speeding home. Uh, a friend of mine has a radio program. His uh, name is Leon Kaplan. He's called the Motor Man. And he taught me something years ago that I thought was fabulous. He said, do you know what the most important safety item in a car happens to be? The most important safety item. Of course, no one could guess what he had in mind. And his answer was, a cop in the rear view mirror and that kept you that kept you safe more than anything else and the same thing is true in an airplane uh, you don't want to speed up in a, in a car or in an airplane doing things in a hurry and perhaps uh, the best way to fly an airplane is imagining there's a flight instructor or an inspector in the right seat of your machine you might fly it a little differently and perhaps uh, a better a better way yeah you know, one thing that, that popped into my head when you were explaining that is, is I think that when a pilot hears that, uh, to, you know, take your time, there's nothing that needs to happen fast. Sometimes it, the thought might be, you know, is that really true? Is that really true? There's probably, as we mentioned with VX, maybe one or two things that you have to have trained in a muscle memory in an emergency that do have to happen fast and everything else can happen slow. Do you think it would help to distinguish that with people and uh, to, to give them some comfort so they understand, look, in this situation, you have to know immediately you push down. But in all these other things, there's so much time. Like, they, they are not critical. Do you think the contrast can help people grasp that? Yeah, there are times when you do want to do things in a hurry, and I think one of those times it might be in the case of an engine fire. Uh, you need to handle that pretty quickly. By the way, do you know most people don't know exactly what to do first step in case of an engine fire? And I always ensure that they know this first step, shut off the fuel. No matter what, shut off the fuel. That's one of those where you don't want to have to go to the book and get the checklist out while you're on fire. That's a good one to know ahead of time. Yeah, <laughs> yes. exactly. Excellent. So what, I mean, so that's a good one, right? I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me, of course. Um, the the fire, uh, perhaps low outlet, that engine failure at low altitude uh, or something like that. Well, um, and an inadvertent spin, I think, requires immediate action, too. Mm -hmm. I think the that's point the is, is, is by, by doing that, you can free everything else that, that, it, that, it, that you should take time. Because I agree with you. It's amazing how many, time, how many problems you get just but, by but, rushing. But mm -hmm. Jeff, these are the resolutions uh, that we uh, apply in the cases of an emergent, of emergencies. What Brian's referring to 
is how we handle a normal operation of the airplane because mm -hmm. accidents and emergencies are caused by doing things too rapidly. Yeah, you're in a hurry to get in the air, you taxi out, we're okay, you might convince yourself to skip the run up or you might skip a step on the checklist or you take off immediately, you don't have your flaps set, fuel selector's not right, cow flaps, something may not be right because you rush. That's what I'm talking about in the normal sense of operating an airplane. When pilots rush, they screw up. I see it all the time. If you just yeah. slow down and take a beat and really exaggerate how slow you're going, uh, I tried doing that once on an airline flight when I was paid by the hour. So we, we realized we got headwinds <laughs> and we're going to go over our normal scheduled time. So I tried operating this flight as slowly as I could. I taxied slow. I did the checklist methodically. We took off. We flew slowly. It was quiet. Landed. I took the. I don't care if I took a downwind and did the longer taxi in instead of a straight in for a short taxi. Then I taxied the airplane really slowly, got there. And it turns out we didn't make any extra money. We got there exactly on time. <laughs> and what I learned from that afterwards, I realized, you know what? We didn't make any money, but boy, was that comfortable operating like that because it, the, the co-pilot was comfortable. Well, so when I do that with student pilots, just take it real slow. Everybody's more comfortable operating slowly like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that leads directly into another topic here that, that I've heard you talk about before, both, both of you, and that is checklists. Uh, everybody's got checklists, but to some degree, it seems in general aviation, there's a little bit of, uh, when you, especially when you, when you own your own plane, et cetera, like they, they seem to fade to the background. They seem to be maybe there for run up, but, but, you know, you just start to know these things. Um, Tell me about how we can improve as a, as a group when it comes to checklists. Well, let me relate to you uh, an experience I had uh, taking off in a Boeing 727 in Albuquerque one night, long, long time ago, really long time ago. And uh, <laughs> uh, we were going through the before takeoff checklist. We completed it, got onto the runway, we advanced the throttles, and all of a sudden we heard beep, 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 a takeoff warning horn. And that horn only sounds if one of several items haven't been complied with on the before takeoff checklist. So we checked all those items and everything had been complied with, everything was correct. Well, we taxied off the runway, of course, to do this and we told the passengers on board the airplane that we uh, had to abort the takeoff because of rabbits on the runway. We went back and we started to take off again after complying with every item on the checklist. I advanced the throttles, beep, 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 again, and we aborted the takeoff. And pretty soon we came to the conclusion that there was a problem with the takeoff warning horn. It wasn't operating properly, so we'll just pull the circuit breaker and take off anyway. We started our takeoff without the takeoff warning horn. The breaker was out. It was quiet and peaceful. And we got to about 60, 70 knots, and the flight engineer called out, Oh, my God, stop the airplane. Abort. What, what's going on? Well, I did, of course. I didn't know what was going on. And we taxied off the runway, and he said, We're supposed to have five degrees of flaps for takeoff at Albuquerque. And I said, Yeah, of course. And we looked at the flaps indicator and it said two flaps two not five all of us had looked at that indicator any number of times and and thought we saw five because we expected to see five but it read two and if we had taken off under those conditions with flaps two on a warm summer night heading for chicago with a full load we wouldn't have made it we wouldn't have made it and so i might not be here was, today we just didn't, you have to look at the item you're checking to make sure that it indicates what it's supposed to indicate, not what you expect it to indicate. It's and that's classic. where the checklist comes really in handy. That story is a classic example of expectation bias. You look at, see what you expected to see, and it, it wasn't really what was. Yeah. Yep, yep. So how do you get past expectation bias because even when you follow a checklist just as you mentioned it's really easy to just read what it says and then people say well then you touch it but well, you don't you, you don't process? read what it says you don't read what it says the way i like to use it brian's the same way most airline airline pilots are the same way 
we go through every item on the checklist without it. And then we simply, we don't use the checklist as an, an instructional manual to, to indicate what we should do. We, make, we, we check everything first, and then we pull out the checklist and make sure we did it. And we look at each item that the checklist calls for. We don't have to do anything. Just look at it, make sure we did it properly. And I think discipline. Discipline is a good answer to your question, Jeff. And patience. Patience and discipline. You need to be disciplined about, you know, operating, doing the checklist, looking very carefully at everything and, and seeing and interpreting, and, and maybe finding a secondary. If you look at your flap indicator, it could be one. The other thing is you could turn your aileron fold down and then look at the down aileron. It should match the flaps for air, most airplanes that have takeoff flaps. Uh, the full down aileron is about what takeoff flap should be. It's about maximum lift. Another pointer there, but uh, find a, a second way to confirm the important stuff. Yeah, I never actually. That's a cool tidbit. I never knew that 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 aileron travel is pretty much uh, the uh, takeoff setting for flaps on on most aircraft. Usually, so that's where you, that's where you want it. Yeah. Very interesting. So. Um, all of this brings out an interesting th thing also. It, uh, Barry, you've written a lot of things about I the, the idea of, of, of flying in safety and danger, and we all have to defend aviation so often, and there was another accident only just recently I saw come across the news, probably today or yesterday. What, how do you view danger when it comes to aviation? What's your view on uh, is generally aviation safe, and how do you describe it to people? Well, this is not popular. Uh, we, especially those of us who fly, like to preach to those of those, those of uh, those who don't that aviation is so safe that it's safer than driving and so forth. Well, it's safer than driving if you're flying on an airliner. It is not safer when you're flying a light general aviation airplane. Flying light airplanes is more dangerous than driving a car. And it's easy to prove, even though you may not want to accept it. Every one of us know people who have died in airplanes. We all know people. Sometimes we know a lot of people who have died in airplanes. Yet, how many people do you really know who have died in automobiles? Not many, I'll wager. I'll bet you that most of us know more people who've died in airplanes than died in cars. And yet, we know more people who die, who drive cars than fly airplanes. So it should be the other way around, and it's not. And this is proof that driving a car is safer than flying a light airplane. And what we have to do is acknowledge that fact so that when you fly or I fly, it will be safer because we're going to make it that way. Mm -hmm. It's to be and the so attitude that we adopt. And my response to that would be, it, it is more dangerous, but it's as safe as you make it. So you can mitigate a lot of that hazard and risk that's there in flying. It's inherently dangerous. There's no question about that. Uh, how does it go? But to an even greater degree than the sea, it's unforgiving of carelessness, incapacity, or neglect, well, then it gets dangerous. I mean, picking up a hot pan is dangerous, right? But you can mitigate that risk by putting a glove on your hand and picking it up. But same with aviation. You need to acknowledge that it's dangerous before you can be a safe pilot because yeah. you need to mitigate all the risks that are involved uh, with a day-to-day -day flight because they, they keep coming at us, all these hazards, and, and, and there are certain risks that we can get rid of and make it safer. Like, I won't fly out of an airport that requires me to take off at VX to clear the obstacles. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm making yep. it safer by doing that. Uh, I can fly a route of flight that might be better than just over the mountains where there's nothing to go. I might go via airports instead. Might add one or two minutes to the flight, but I'm mitigating some of that risk and taking some of that danger away. And the last thing I tell my students is that it's okay to be a little bit afraid. I mean, not too much afraid that you're paranoid, but enough afraid that you're gonna take precautions and, and always ask yourself, well, what if this happens? And then try to mitigate it. That that makes a lot of sense. I, you know, one of the things that's that's clawing at me, I would love to hear from, from each of you, if there were something that you could kind of magically uh, change and improve in mm -hmm. the general aviation pilot population, like if each of you had, if I had a wish of one thing, I would make sure that, that pilots 
uh, uh, improved on or did something that you think would improve safety. What I'm curious, what, what would that be? What's the first thing that pops into your mind? We'll start with Barry. What's the first thing, if you could say, you could pick one thing that people would do differently in the population? Well, let me, let me, let me tell a little story that I think can help to make your flying safer. I was with um, Brian's mother, actually, in a light airplane uh, with another couple flying in East Africa. And we were heading toward a place called the Mount Kenya Safari Club, heading from Nairobi, about 200 miles distance to this, distant to this place where we had paid for our hotel accommodations, we paid for the lodge, paid for our safari. We paid a lot of money and we were heading down there looking forward to this adventure. And yet there were a bunch of thunderstorms in the area. And I kept thinking, well, if I head around this way and I head around that way, we can get there. Uh, I've got to be careful, though, to obviously avoid these thunderstorms. And Frank Taylor, who was also our family doctor, he said to me, he said, he said, let's 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 go back to Nairobi. And I said, wait a minute, Frank, we have paid hundreds of dollars for our safari and for our nights, three nights accommodation there, and our whole trip is predicated on this place. And he said, look, if we turn around and we don't go there in five or 10 years, it will not have made any difference at all. We won't care whether we'd been there or not, or maybe even a year from now. He said, but if we hit one of those thunderstorms, I guarantee you it'll affect us for the rest of our lives. And so he said, it didn't matter how important it was to get there. It, it just wasn't worth risking or taking chances to do so. So we turned around, we went back to Nairobi, gave up all that money. It hurt, but we were safe. I've done that, I might not be here today. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Yeah. That, so, so that makes a lot of sense. So I mean, so if you were to change one thing, it would be that, that push that people have to make destination to make items. Happen. It's what makes airline pilots so safe. The airline pilot has no vested interest in his destination. He could care less whether he gets there or not. If he goes to an alternate, so what? He might even make more money doing that. <laughs> the point is, the point the is pilot next to you is not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> Depends yeah. on what plans I have for the layover. <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, but not caring about your destination can make you safer. I agree. Mm -hmm. We we upset a lot of people in the back when we have delays because we're not taking into account. Uh, when we make a decision, am I going to fly with this malfunction or not? I don't consider, well, the couple in 12B and A have a wedding they need to make, and I got a ball club that's going out there, and they have a, a game to play. I'm not taking that into consideration when I decide go or no go. It's mm -hmm. just pure safety. Yeah. You know, and I'll, I'll mea culpa on this one because I've thought more than once when I've been asked, you know, what minimum, what, what my minimums are for different things or what wind would you fly in or what things like that, I've often thought, well, what, where am I, what's happening? Is it a trip I'm about to take? Then I know I can, I can do this. Am I just going up for fun? Then I wouldn't do it. Um, and I think that's a slippery slope. Yeah, you need to take your, your inner passenger and put them in the back seat and be a pilot in command of that airplane. and regard safety more than the reason you're going yeah. yeah 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 very and i've heard a lot of pilots also make comments about uh weather or situations that they would fly in being different if they had their family on board or if they didn't or other situational things it's really interesting to hear people talk about it that uh, uh that that that's it that's probably the biggest thing to change brian is there something different that pops into your mind as you're if you were going to kind of wave a magic wand and this one were already taken by your dad? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, actually, from all the accidents that I've studied, uh, I see a common denominator that at some point, the pilot gets outside of an envelope. You exceed a limitation of the airplane or you bust an FAR or you don't follow your insurance regulations or the rental agreement uh, somewhere. So my advice, my one wish would be that every pilot stay inside the envelope. 
that envelope is defined by the limits we're given by the regulations, the AIM, advisory circulars, insurance companies, aircraft limitations, rental agreements. The insurance companies put limits on that for a reason because it's more hazardous mm -hmm. and they're trying to keep that from happening. If you stay inside and really strictly follow all those rules and maybe even give yourself a little bit more of a pad outside those. Yes, I can fly when it's 3.1 miles, I can go VFR, but maybe I'm not going to do it unless it's five miles. Mm -hmm. uh, and just don't break that. Stay inside the envelope. That's my advice. That's That would be my wish if I could wave a magic wand that every pilot would follow the rules, the procedures, the policies, their own personal minimums, and stay inside the envelope. That makes a lot of sense, and I think that that applies to so many things. You mentioned that applies to weather conditions and visibility, might yeah. apply to to size of airport you can fly into or conditions, and of course fuel. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. gonna, right. it keeps people from stretching out fuel. Don't get into that 45 minute reserve. It's there for an emergency or the 30 minute reserve. Yeah, land uh, and mm -hmm. don't climb out of VX, but slow down, operate it slow, not the other one. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I'll, I'll, there, I'll, there are some great tips. Uh, uh, John and Martha King actually taught me something that uh, uh, I found to be of value. Uh, if you are heading toward your destination and you're running low on fuel, you know, it's one thing to stop short of your destination and pick up fuel. But the kings say, well, if, you're, if, you, if you doubt if you can make it, if you might not be able to make it, if there's a chance you might not be able to make it, if you might have to land short, why not land at the halfway point? And that way you land with a lot of fuel and you'll land at your destination with a lot of fuel. You'll always have a lot of fuel. If you're going to have to land, land halfway. I think it's a great idea. I, I agree. I think that's an excellent one. And I'll, I'll yeah. since we're all, all chatting here together, I'll throw out, you know, my own that, that I've kind of learned from my flying that I, if I were to put a wish out there and it would be when, when, when something seems wrong, uh, uh, in, in the situation, uh, I've kind of learned the hard way that the best thing you can do is, is back up, back off, put yourself into a safe situation to figure it out instead of, of combining something urgent with something not right and something not feeling right. I've I've been in a pattern at, at, at unfamiliar airports maneuvering and can't get lights on and later find out I was on the wrong frequency or all sorts of different things. It, it, even in weather, it's, I, it took a lot for, for me to accept that, it, it, that you could actually just go back up and take a minute, figure yeah, it all out. Your subliminal mind makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up or your gut tells you something is just not right, listen to it, because it's usually right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my, one of my favorite uh, methods of staying safe is to, to reaffirm that the most important safety instrument in the airplane is your gut. And if your gut says, eh, something's not quite right, believe it, because it probably isn't. And my gut's bigger than me, so I listen to it. <laughs> as, <laughs> so um as we've been talking about some of these dire types of things of course and uh you know one of the things that that you've written uh, quite a bit about barry has to do with that uh, the ultimate situation of when you have to ditch an aircraft what type of advice do you have for people when it comes to that kind of end uh, 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 that we don't wish for oh well it's easy don't do it <laughs> uh, okay, this, next topic. <laughs> there's some interesting uh, uh, rules about ditching that uh, most people really are, uh, are not aware of it. Uh, for example, most people would say they'd rather ditch a, a low-wing airplane than a high-wing airplane. Now, that seems logical because the planing of the wings along the surface of the water will make it a safer landing. But you know you're safer in a high-wing airplane? And here's why. If you land with a low-wing airplane and you have the flaps extended, because you'll want to have them extended, the water's going to tear them off and could also flood the wings, uh, which makes it uh, a little more dangerous. Also, if you're going to... How about that? My light fell off. Let me put my, put my light back on. Do I need a light? Do we have outtakes? We think you're bright regardless. <laughs> this is weird. Uh, anyway, uh, if you're landing in the water with a low wing and you I gotcha. use your... 
Maybe I can put this. I, I, I knew we weren't going to make it through a program without this. <laughs> this is an emergency, and I'm going to handle it properly. There we go. Anyway, if you're landing in the water and you, you might need to keep your roll under control and you use your ailerons, that may cause you in any roll situation at all to hit the water. So it's really a far more dangerous in most cases to to ditch an airplane with low wings. With high wings, you'll land on the belly, the wings are way above the water, so the flaps can be down to slow you down without any risk of them being torn off during the run out. And you can use your ailerons to control roll without any risk of the ailerons uh, contacting the water. But by the time you're in a position to ditch, you can't change airplanes at that time. I'm just saying what's better. I'm not saying I didn't say. <laughs> right. Barry's solution is that the last item on your checklist is to turn and go. I knew we should have been in assessment. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Jason, a lot of people feel like in 172s and whatnot that they'd be better off in Cherokees. Not necessarily mm. so. I'd much no. rather be in the high wing airplane in a case like that. Uh, yeah, no, that, that makes a, a lot point of, that, a point that I'm raising. That's all. They do look cooler. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but they do look cooler in the Cherokees. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> well, they do look cool until the airplane breaks apart. <laughs> also, uh, a lot of people feel that you're better off flying in an airplane and ditching in an airplane that has retractable landing gear uh, because that way the, the landing will be smoother. But it's been shown that in most cases, airplanes that have landed with, with fixed landing gear have survived better than those with retractable gear. And the reason is that the, the airplanes with fixed landing gear land more slowly than hmm. airplanes that have retractable gear. So uh, it, it's not so bad to have to ditch with uh, fixed gear. Got it. That, that makes touching, a lot of sense. Catching the water at as slow a possible speed, I guess, would be a good piece of advice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, you don't want to stall the airplane during the touchdown. You want to fly it on as slowly as possible, but do not stall it. And if there are swells, you want to land parallel to the swells. <laughs> that is swell, Brian. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, Brian, you uh, uh, we were talking a while ago about uh, uh, soft field takeoffs, and you brought up that here's a little tidbit about trim that I had not had not thought that much about. Tell me a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, so when I'm teaching private or commercial and we're doing soft field landings, uh, I bet them that I can hold the nose off longer than they can for the soft field landing because uh, the idea is to hold the nose off as long as you can, protect that nose gear uh, through the rollout, because it, yeah, the, the thought is if it hits the ground or the, the soft field or the sand or whatever you're landing in, that it might dig in and, and you could tumble over. Um, so the idea is to hold the nose off as long as possible. So I bet them, how long can you keep the nose off the ground? They do it, then they, they start trimming. And so my question is, what can you do with the trim to help you keep the nose off the ground longer, and uh, do you have a do you have a picture that shows the two different choices? Yeah, let me bring that up here. So if you really had to land, let's say you're landing on a beach with soft sand, uh, too many people out near the hard packed sand, is there anything that you can do to facilitate keeping that nose out of digging out of the, into the sand for as long as possible? And the question is, full nose up trim, full nose down trim. Which way would you go? And most pilots will answer, well, I'm trying to keep the nose off the ground. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get full nose up trim. And as it turns out, yeah, you're going to have the trim tab help you hold the elevator up. That's what trim does. But as it turns out, the answer in the next picture you can see is full nose down trim, B in this case, actually gives you a little bit more surface into the wind, cutting into that relative wind. It gives more effectiveness on the elevator, it's heavier when you have full nose down trim and it's harder to hold off because that surface is doing more work and holding right. that tail down. So you're giving the elevator basically more surface to, to cut into the wind. And, and I can almost taxi off the runway with full nose down trim 
and a little bit of power touchdown and we can slow down and I can just do a wheelie all the way off the runway. Uh, try it sometime, but make sure you know your airplane and if you're not comfortable, have an instructor with you for sure. But if you're trying to hold that nose off the ground as long as you can, while the nose, you get that feeling it's about to start coming down, just start getting in full nose down trim and hold that elevator back and it'll get heavier and heavier, but it's going to work. It's going to give you some more force to hold the tail down. Yeah, now, it's gonna, the important thing to realize is that nose up trim makes it easier to hold the elevator up, but nose down trim makes it more effective. That's fascinating. And I never, ever thought about that, but it is now the next test that I am going to run, especially since I've got electric trim. In my case, I can sit there and right on, right on touchdown and roll out, start going down and keep pulling back and see how much I can keep the nose off as that, as you mentioned, as, as both of the, in my case, both of the elevator trim tabs start coming up and giving me more and more elevator. So I want you to do that in your airplane, but then afterwards, I want you to tell me, you'll be impressed with how well it works. I, I promise you that. But then I want you to send me a picture of your tail tie down ring. <laughs> You're going to be and like, also, it's going to work so well that you'll be repairing your tail. <laughs> also, a if you get to a point where you have full nose down trim and you will, do not make a go around. That's a good point. Safety tip. Excellent point. Very good point. Experiments not to be running on, in dangerous situations and where you may be doing a go around. Yeah, so it's not published in the book for a soft field procedure, but knowing your systems, knowing a little bit more about aerodynamics and thinking a little bit outside the box, not the envelope. <laughs> I want you to stay inside the envelope, but thinking outside the box and knowing a little bit more about your systems and aer aerodynamics and how it works, it might be a little different with a stabilator though. So mm -hmm. just something to think about. Let me let me take that again without a stabilator. Let me take that to another level and ask you a question, because you mentioned soft field. We're talking about keeping taking uh, keeping the nose off during landing. Does that mean uh, that if we stay, every everyone's got a green band generally on their trim, so that if you're staying within the green band, but does that mean that if you are at the down side of the band, that you effectively have more elevator available to you to get the nose off the ground first sooner during a soft field takeoff is that something that that's worth experimenting with yeah, i would say i don't want to tell anybody that way. <laughs> yeah I, would, I never want to take off out of the band uh well i said I inside that, inside yeah yeah so toward the tail end of it is going to give you toward the the nose down part of the green band is going to give you more authority but know your airplane. I'd hate for somebody to not have the strength to pull it off the ground at that point uh, because it's going to be more difficult because you're doing more work, but you need to be able to do that work. Uh, I'm going to advise no one do that on takeoff. It's not no, as necessary. I would recommend against go getting airborne being out of trim. I agree. Okay. Um, for the record, I was talking <laughs> inside the range, but yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, you know, I don't think uh, it should even be within the green band. I mean, you can you can be in trouble if you get too far out of what you should have, because mm -hmm. some of these allowable trim bands, depending on your speed, uh, you might be in the wrong place at the wrong time, but and the wrong kind even of if you're trim. inside the green band. I wouldn't wouldn't do it. Uh, uh, you're accelerating. This yeah. This is strictly for on the ground. Yeah, and you're accelerating into a situation where now that elevator force gets can be over overwhelming and maybe you can't overcome it. Got it. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, Barry, one of the things that is my favorite videos that you have ever done uh, talks about uh, control system failures and um, and broken cables for one. Not a very common uh, thing, but, but certainly uh, a situation that there's been some recent ADs on and service bulletins. So it's enough of a concern that there are aircraft that, that have things like that. And um, tell me a little bit about uh, the, the, that concept of, of cables. It's a, uh, there's a lot to talk about when you talk about uh, flying an airplane with uh, broken control cables. Uh, let me try to simplify it if I can. Uh, if you have a broken rudder cable or a broken aileron cable, you're going to have to use the other control to keep the airplane going straight. And, and, and I'm, 
I don't want to get too deeply involved in, in those because it's relatively simple. If you lose your ailerons, you can use your rudders to keep the airplane going in the direction you want. Uh, and that takes a little bit of practice, but it's not too difficult. What will get most people into a lot of trouble is when they have a broken elevator cable. That gets really serious and people have been killed as the result of it. Uh, here's what happens. Let's say that you're, you're doing a steep turn and all of a sudden you have all this back pressure and twang, you hear something pop and the stick comes all the way back in your lap. It just, nothing happens. The interesting aspect of that is that you can move the stick forward. You don't want to because you're, you know, you, you want to keep the nose up, but you, you do have forward elevator control, even though you don't have back elevator control. So the question now becomes, how are you going to land this airplane? How are you going to control it? Well, in the case of losing up elevator cable, what you need to do is start trimming the airplane. And that, that kind of becomes obvious. Uh, and you're going to use nose up trim to help get the nose up. Now, when you're going to come in for a landing, what are you going to do with that, con that trim tab? Think about that. I'm asking you, Jeff. What would you do with it if you're coming in for a landing and you have no nose up control? Well, I guess the idea is that you want to use your trim to replace that. And so you're going to keep putting that in uh, for, for is, more up. Which way are you going to apply the trim? You have no nose up control. So I'm going to want the trim full up. Okay, if you apply the, the trim nose all the way up, the nose is going to come all the way up, right? Right. So now the way you land the airplane is you're going to have to push hard to overcome that trim to get the nose down because you do have nose down control, not nose up, nose down. So you're yep. gonna push hard on the nose to push it down. And now to make the landing is you start releasing the back pressure you've been holding to keep the nose down. The forward mm -hmm. pressure. Forward pressure, you release yep. that forward pressure and allow, there's that light again. <laughs> and the way you'll land the airplane is by releasing the forward pressure. And so instead of pulling back to flare, you're pushing, pushing, pushing. When it's time to flare, just stop pushing as hard, letting the trim do the work. And it's it just sense. the opposite if you lose your ability to push the nose down. If you lose nose down control, what you'll do is go to nose down trim, pull the wheel back because you now have control of the uh, up elevator and the way you land the airplane is just the opposite of the way you did before yep no that make that's that makes sense even though it, it may not be something that just readily comes to mind i mean the idea no, that that all of the controls in our aircraft uh, uh when they are cable controlled are, are independent you know one cable to pull up one cable to pull pull down one cable right. to roll right one cable to roll left that's and right. that if you have if you whether it's elevator aileron or anything if you trim against that then you have reestablished to some degree the continuity of your system. That's right. You, and you can well, practice this. I would recommend doing it with an instructor. You can practice the loss of up elevator or down elevator cable and using these techniques. And if, if it were to really happen to you, you duck soup. And I can tell you one thing that we were able to do in a Cessna 172. We pretended as though we lost all control cables aileron, rudder, and elevator. And what we did was he opened the doors. And you could open one door one way, open one door the other way. You have to have long arms. But you Try can that open the doors way. to make the airplane <laughs> turn right and left. And then you'd use the trim tab to make the landing. That is my favorite video you have ever done. For anyone out there that hasn't seen it, there is a video of Barry flying and landing an airplane without touching the, uh, the, the the control wheel at all, it's, it is the coolest thing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great fun. It takes do that. a lot of practice. When he was teaching me to fly, he made me go through that exercise as well. And it's a good exercise. Yeah. Uh, with the control 
cable broken, you know, it's intuitive. You think you're going to fly with the trim. You don't have to just get it full in one direction, fight it the other way and not complicated. But if you give it no forethought or listen to a discussion like this, it may not come to mind if it ever happens to you, but just having it in the back of your head is a great idea. Yeah, that's that, that I, I love it. Um, listen, we, in the very uh, little bit of time that we've got left to talk, I want to get to some of the fun stuff that is always a hallmark of having both of you on the show. And, um, uh, a very, one of the ones that I love is, uh, you're, you've talked about w or word origins and some fun things having to do with flying. So give us a little nugget of your wisdom here on, on this. Well, I can <clears throat> give you a few definitions of origins of words which are kind of fun uh we talk about an airport being socked in now you know where okay. does that come from why do we say socked in well it it originated with the french they would have a windsock on the airport of course the way we do but when <laughs> the weather got bad they would take the sock off the mast and bring it into the shack or the hangar or whatever and so when the sock was in, the field weather was bad. The field was socked in, no sock, and you couldn't fly until they brought the sock out. I guess that would be socked out, I guess. <laughs> anyway, uh, another fun one is uh, the word hangar. Why do we refer to a storage space for an airplane as a hangar? Well, it's a French word. It, the, the word is really hangar, and it means outhouse or shed. And and that's where the French kept their airplanes in, a, basically a, a shed. An outhouse? Uh, or an outhouse, I guess. Some airplanes are I need are to go into the bathroom. I'll be back in a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know where the word joystick came from. Oh, joystick is fun. Why do we call it a joystick? I can think of well, one reason. But... Huh? Nothing. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I... I... <laughs> We call it a joystick because the control stick at one time was invented by a guy named Harold Joyce. And the control stick was called a joyce stick, which is hard to say, joyce stick. So it became foreshortened to joystick. And that's where that came from. Uh, same thing, it, the computer joystick uh, comes from the same one. Same, oh, that's same, awesome. Same origin. I like I like pedo tube. Why do why do we call it a pedo tube? Uh, and and I like explaining this because I like to say the word. Uh, it was invented by Henri Pito, <laughs> and he used it to measure uh, the speed of the water in the Seine River in in Paris. Uh, he was a hydraulics engineer, and he liked to measure the speed of water. But the same thing could be used. Uh, to measure the speed of air. So uh, in honor of Henri Pito, we call it a Pito tube. <laughs> the the Pitot. And I'll give you one more. That'll be the end of it. Uh, hijack. Why do we hijack? Why do we refer to the, uh, the hijacking of airplanes as a hijack? What did, where'd that come from? It actually originated back in the days of... Uh, uh, when, when, when liquor, alcohol was illegal, what, where were those days? Prohibition. It originated during the days of Prohibition, and trucks would be traveling down the highway with a lot of booze on board, and uh, highwaymen would uh, stop the truck, and uh, they'd point the gun at the driver and say, raise him high, Jack, meaning, <laughs> you know, hi, Jack. That's where that came from. What was that like during Prohibition? Thanks, Brian. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brian, it's your turn then. Give me some FAA acronym stories or anything around or acronyms that exist that we don't know about. Oh, there's a lot of acronyms. I actually, in one of my presentations, made an acronym to remember all the acronyms. Uh, <laughs> there's just so many. It's overwhelming. And I'm you know, generally not a fan uh, of, because I can't spell. Uh, <laughs> but, but I do like... PAVE is a teaching concept, you know, the four pillars of what you're going to do in your pre-flight planning because you got to worry about the pilot, the airplane, all the environmental factors, and then external pressures is a very important thing. So I like to teach that. I think it's a very core uh, acronym, but I, I, I just think there are too many of them. 
Uh, there is the decide model for making decisions. There's the 5P model for making decisions and the 3P model for decision making. I mean, really go through the uh, ACS, the, Advi the uh, Airman Certification Standards, and you'll see all these. And there's, there's, there's just so much that I can't, first of all, I can't spell, like I said. And second of all, I just, if it's a rule of thumb, I'll get the wrong thumb. I like what to about just, UGA? The UGA, UDA loop, O-O-D-A is another one. Uh, and I'm, I'm here to tell you, I couldn't tell you what these stand for today, you know, uh, 20 plus thousand hours and, and, and somehow I've made it without knowing all these acronyms. But I just think there, there are too many of them, uh, you know, the A tomato flames. I'd rather you just remember part 91 to 15 and know where to go to find out all the yeah, equipment required on the airplane. That may, I can't spell tomato. There are a couple ways to spell <laughs> Tomato. Tomato. Yeah, and, and a tomato on fire is just not going to do it for me. Tomato. <laughs> not tomato, tomato. Right. Right. Potato, potato? Yeah, Pave, I like gumps, you know, for landing. I like cigars for takeoff. I like, what about, <laughs> uh, remember uh, how you taught me to work, figure out my, uh, my compass heading, Dad? And I think a lot of people still teach this today. I still teach it. Uh, but I don't think, you know, it's probably offensive now to talk about it. Yeah. But it's true. That true virgins make dull company? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, because... <laughs> well, backwards, true, it's Ken I've Ducks never heard that one. Burns. True virgins, yeah. So it's true course and then variation, correct for variation. Then you get uh, uh, magnetic course. Then you correct for wind and, and deviation to get compass heading. And, and so the TVMDC uh, was true <laughs> Virgins make dull company. It's it's one of those like east is least, west is best. And I know that's probably not a fan. You're in Boston, right? So you probably don't like that one. <laughs> I I don't know. I remember from the King stuff that it was. Uh, uh, I think people in the east are odd, but people in the west are even odder. <laughs> Can't argue that. Can't argue. No that. Argument. <laughs> So uh, you gave me one, you sent me one last image here, which seems like a pretty good wrap up. When I interviewed at TWA, I'm sitting in a small room with two people interviewing me uh, and they, this poster was hanging on the wall. And it said, you know, said the most important wings on a plane are on the pilot. And one of my last questions in my interview was, what does this mean to you? And it really got me thinking how important that is. You know, airplanes aren't crashing so much because the wing snaps off or really from mechanical failures. It's, it's from pilot error and pilots screwing up or bad decisions. Many good pilots do dumb things. I mean, we, we, we read about stupid pilot tricks all the time. And so I think if, if that poster was hung up in every flight school, I would like to see that because it really gets you thinking that, you know, as a pilot wears the wings on their uniform. How important it is to, to respect the power you've been given, the responsibility you have, and the outcome, the results of the outcome of your flight are on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'd just like to thank both of you for taking time again out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live and impart so much wisdom and fun and, and lessons for everyone. Uh, it, it's, it, it's always a treasure to have you both here on Social Flight Live. Well, Jeff, it's always a pleasure to finish talking to you. I mean, to be on your show. <laughs> That's my son. I know. It'd be great without it. It's just one word short of being complimentary. <laughs> I don't one know. word long of being complimentary. Yeah. Stay inside the envelope. Yeah, Stay inside and, the and, envelope. Uh, and, and, and talking about safety can be fun. Absolutely. Well, Barry and Brian, I hope you will join us again here on Social Flight Live because uh, we really, really do enjoy having you on the show and getting a chance to, 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 to learn a little bit each time and, and build everyone's knowledge. Thanks for having us. It's Absolutely. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. So, and also, of course, to all of you, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live as well. We're here for you, of course, and to support all of general aviation. And we hope we brighten up your evening and your week 
and do whatever we can to get you out there and flying. Next Tuesday, we are back with another Social Flight Live. Tuesday, March 8th, we are here with former United States Air Force Thunderbirds pilot Nicole Malakowski will be rejoining us. She was on the show once. We're going to talk about all sorts of new things this time. She is a truly amazing individual, and I would definitely encourage you not to miss that show. In addition, on Tuesday, March 15th at 8 p.m., as always, we are joined here by Mike Kennedy of Airplane Repo. There's some amazing stories coming with that. That is for sure with his time on the show and afterwards and so many cool things that he does in his life. And on Tuesday, March 22nd at 8 p.m., record-setting pilot Bruce Bohannon will be joining us. He's recently uh, uh, been uh, put into the Texas Aviation Hall of Fame. And lastly, on Tuesday, March 29th, 8 p.m. again, legendary aviatrix and writer Martha Lunkin will be joining us. Until next time, thank you so much, and I wish you all blue skies. Mm -hmm.